Hi, this is Dan Passarelli. Welcome to How to Protect Your Positions with Collar Spreads. Now, before we get started, I would like to point out that options are not for everyone and you should read characteristics and risks of standardized options before trading. Options are really useful vehicles. I love them. I feel that they level the playing field between the professional traders and just regular old retail traders like you and me. And one of the things that options can be used for is to help protect long-term holdings, like if I own stocks or ETFs or futures in my IRA. But the strategy must be structured correctly. Otherwise, we can end up putting on a hedged position to try and protect ourselves but it ends up potentially not being worth it. So I wanna start out this conversation by talking about protective puts. Now a protective put is when I own stock and then I buy an out of the money put to protect that long stock. Now the advantage of this is that I have limited risk, but it can come at a big cost. For protective puts, we want to limit our downside risk potential on a stock that we already own. And so we buy a put on the stock. And when we do that, we will then have the right to sell the stock at an agreed price, the strike price, until the expiration date. So let me show you exactly what I mean by all of this. So imagine here that we own 100 shares of the Spiders ETF and it's trading at $477.30. Well, one of the things we can do is buy a protective put. And in this case, we'll look at buying the regular February expiration at $7.43. Now here's what that implies. The dotted line is if I just simply owned the 100 shares and didn't use the options. The green sort of kinked hockey stick looking line is if I own the 100 shares and also bought the put. Now, if, if I do that, I end up with a similar but different position. And there are a few important key differences. One is if I'm below the strike price at expiration, $473 in this case. If I'm below $473 at expiration, what I can do is I own the right to sell those 100 shares at $473. Now, if we're trading at 472 or 470 or 460 or $400, there's an inherent benefit that comes along with that. The lower the stock goes, the better the insurance does for me. But I pay for that insurance. I pay $7.43. So if I own the stock at $477.30 and it falls to $473, and I exercise my right to sell that those shares at $473, I would lose $4.30 on the shares. but I also paid $7.43. So I can lose up to $11.73. So that's about two and a half percent. And I only have that protection for 44 days, right? As of uh, today, if you're watching this live, that's how many days there was until February expiration. So, I mean, if, if the stock falls, or excuse me, if the spiders fall two and a half percent or more, then I'm in a better situation, right? But here's the thing. If, well, actually, let me go back for one second. So we're really, we would really only choose to do this if we're looking for a pretty big drop. Two and a half percent is is a pretty big sort of common drop. It's not like a huge one day correction. It's not a market crash. 
it's a fairly big one, you know, one day or, or, or maybe like, you know, one week drop. Now, this, so if we're only looking for a very small drop, we probably wouldn't want to do this. Now, another thing to consider here is that, is that if the shares are above the strike price, like if it's 474 or 478 or 490, we wouldn't exercise the right to sell the shares at 473. But we still paid for that right. We paid $7.43. So 743 divided by 477.30 is 1.6%. So we're giving up 1.6% no matter what happens, even if we're in a good situation. So basically in order to break even to get to this spot right here, that's the break even, the spiders would have to rally 1.6%. Now, if you think about it, there's a, an important implication that might not be obvious until it's pointed out. If, if we're paying 1.6% for 44 days, there are roughly 12 44 day periods in a year. So 12 times 1.6% is about 19% a year. Like if we did this every, every six weeks, every 44 days, 12 times a year in a row, we would lose 19% a year to carry that position year round. And that doesn't count the, you know, the, the, what I like to call the deductible, which is the strike price. That insurance doesn't really kick in until it falls below the strike price. So buying puts is very, very expensive. It's a very expensive way to hedge your positions, but it is something that can be overcome. And we can do that by using a covered call to create a collar. So first, let's break down covered calls if you're not familiar with that. The definition is I own 100 shares and I sell a call against those 100 shares. So in this case, I'm not paying for insurance. I'm literally collecting premium when I sell the call. But the trade-off there is that I limit my upside exposure. So we basically want to generate income. That's the whole reason we're doing this, to collect that extra money. And if the shares of spiders goes up really high, we're going to end up selling it at the strike price. And we would be okay with that if we choose to do the covered call position. All right. So here's how that works. Say we own 100 shares of spiders and they're trading at 477.30. We could choose to sell the February 482 calls at $6.34 in this case. So we're collecting $6.34. So we have something that ends up looking kind of like this here, right? <clears throat> the straight black line is just simply owning the shares. And the, the kinked line there, that is owning the shares and also having sold the call. So we've got like a similar, but importantly different thing that we had with, the, with buying the protective put. Here, if the shares are below the strike price, so below 482, and by the way, I wanna point out, we're already starting out with the shares below the strike price. Right, they're at 477.30 when we initiate this trade. So as if it goes down, or if it stays where it is, or if it goes up to all the way to 40, uh, 481.99, as long as it stays below that strike price, we keep by expiration we keep the stock. The call expires and and just goes away, but we get to keep the six dollars and thirty four cents that we collected when we sold the call. So we always outperform simply, simply owning the stock as long as we're below the strike price. If we're above the strike price, here's what happens. We end up selling the shares at the strike at 482. And so let's see. Four, uh, let's see here. What do I have? 
482 minus 477.30 is what? $4.70. But that's plus the $6.34 that we collected for the call. So that's a total maximum profit of 1104. Now, if you think about it, that's not really that bad of a deal. Uh, the trade-off here though, is if the stock goes up a lot, if it goes, uh, if spiders go up to say 500, we could end up potentially leaving a lot of money on the table, but we still have a winning trade. So look, below the strike price, we bring in basically 1.3% over this 44 day period, because that's $6.34 divided by 477.30. The best case scenario, if spiders are above 482, the most we can make is 2.3%. <clears throat> now 2.3% over a 44 day period, you know, we, we could conceivably do the same math we did the last time, just multiply that times 12. And, you know, if we do this over and over again, that's, you know, that's not a bad return. That said, on any one individual trade, we could feel like we left money on the table. So the premium is 1.3% for 44 days. We collect the premium, we still have the downside risk, just as much risk as we would have if we owned the shares, but we might have to sell the shares if they go up too high. All right, so now, now let's talk about collars. Cause you know, like with the covered calls, we didn't have any real protection to the downside. I mean, one could argue that we had limited protection, the $6 and, or like here, the $6 and uh, 34 cents that we collected is basically, is basically, you know, limited downside insurance. But if, if, if the shares fall, fall more than $6.34, the trade ends up being a loser. So we don't really have that big protection. So that is where collars come in. A collar is a strategy that can help protect long stock or futures for that matter at a low cost. It's an investor oriented strategy. And, you know, it's not a magic bullet that comes with a, a trade off, I, I guess, with a couple of trade offs. So a collar is basically just a combination of the two strategies we just talked about. It's a combination of the protective put with a covered call at the same time. So there's three legs to this trade. We own the stock, we're short a call, and we're long a put. So we end up with a limited risk and limited reward strategy. Now the rationale for a collar is we want to limit our downside risk uh, on shares that we own, just like we would with a protective put. And so we're literally going to buy a protective put. But because protective puts are so expensive, we're going to sell a covered call and collect some premium to help finance what we pay for the put. So we're going to have the right to sell the shares at the put strike price until the expiration date. And we might have the obligation of having to sell the shares at the calls strike price if we get assigned, if, if spiders are trading above the strike price. So let's look at how all this works together. Here we own a hundred shares of spiders at 477.30, we just keep it really easy. And we're gonna buy that same February 473 put at 743. And we're also going to sell that same February 482 call at 637. So we own the shares. How much are we paying for the option position? Now, in this case, we're paying a dollar six because we're paying 743 for the puts, but we're collecting 637 for the calls. So 743 minus 637 is a dollar oh six. Now, this is what we're paying for the protection this time, much less than if we just bought the put, right? Now, I will tell you, there are ways to construct these collars 
a little bit out of the scope of what we're talking about in this more introductory class today, where it costs you zero, or maybe even you get a credit, you get paid to put on this position. But that's a little bit more for a class for a different day. All right, so here's how this works. We own the shares at 477.30. We bought the 473 puts at 743. We sell the 482 calls at 637. So we paid a net of a dollar six. And basically, like we're gonna we're just gonna make this really, really simple, do some easy, easy math here. If we're above, well, okay, let's start out with the downside. If we're below 473 at expiration, what happens? Well, if we're below 473, our 482 call would expire and just go away but we would exercise our 473 puts and sell the shares at 473. So how much could we possibly lose if that happened? Well, we own the stock at 477.30. We sell it at 473. So that's, what does that come out to? $4.30, but we also paid $1.06. So $4.30 plus $1.06 means the most we can lose is $5.36. Now that's less than we could lose if we just bought the put. So in some ways it's better protection. But the trade-off is that if the, well, if the shares are between the two strike prices at expiration, we still own the shares and both of the options expire and we're, we, we do like a dollar six worse, right? Because we paid for that, that spread, that collar position and both the options expired. So we lose an extra dollar six. But if we're above the strike price, the call strike price at expiration here, here's where the trade-off kicks in. If we're above 482 at expiration, we'd get assigned on the 482 calls and we'd sell the shares at 482. We owned them at 477.30. So 482 minus 477.30 is $4.70, right? $4.70 minus 106. So 470 minus 106 is $3.64. So our maximum profit is $3.64. So where's our best case scenario here? I mean, our best case scenario is that we stay above 477.30, but below 482. Now, a couple of other nuances to point out here that I think are important is we here we can lose up to 1.1% and we have protection for 44 days. So just kind of doing that same math, it's more like we could lose a maximum of 13% over a year if we just did this over and over and over again. But I'm gonna show you a couple of little tricks to further minimize the cost of this. And that's coming up in just a minute. The other thing to take into account here is we can only make 0.8% over the next 44 days. So that comes out to about 10% a year. So. If we're looking like if we, okay, so look, what expectations do we have here? Well, <clears throat> if we think that the stock or the stock, or in this case, shares of the ETF are going to just really continue higher and we don't have much worry, we wouldn't want to do this because we give up upside. And granted, you know, this comes out to roughly about 10% a year, which is roughly what the SP 500 tends to go up in a year period. But why would we want to limit, you know, limit ourselves? It's not like a horrible limitation, but it is a limitation. The protection here is very, very low cost. If I were just to buy the puts, that's seven dollars and forty-three cents. Here, instead, we're only paying a dollar six. So we, we've discovered a way <clears throat> to have that, have that insurance at a very, very low cost. The same insurance that we would like to have if we just simply owned, you know, just owned the put outright, but we're paying for it with that trade-off. 
we're paying for it with that possibility of maybe getting assigned on the calls. <clears throat> now, I use sort of arbitrarily the 473 puts and the 482 calls, but I don't necessarily have to. If I want more insurance, or I should say, if I want a lower deductible, I could do, I could buy like maybe the 474 puts instead, or maybe the 475 puts or even the 476 puts. Now those higher strike puts would add more cost to, to my trade, but my, my deductible, right? My insurance kicks in a lot earlier. It doesn't have to fall all the way to 473. If I buy the 474 strike, it only has to fall to 474. Um, also, I could choose to instead do a lower call strike. If I sell a lower call strike, I take in more premium and that makes my collar position less expensive. That said, if the underlying rises, I would get a sign faster and I would, you know, I'd leave more money on the table or I'd limit my upside potential more. So collars can also often be established at close to no cost. Collars are often established with longer term options, sometimes using options with one year or more to ex expiration. And it's still a low cost. So let's look at how this looks. Here, we're looking at about a one year collar. So we own spiders. I'm just using the same price here, 477.30. <clears throat> and I'm going to buy one-year options. But look, the underlying stock can move a lot more in one year than it can move in 44 days. So we're going to want to give ourselves more breathing room. We're going to want to buy a lower strike price for the puts, and we're going to want to sell a higher strike price for the calls, just to give ourselves more room. So here in this case, we buy the 435 puts at 27.17 and sell the 520 calls at 14.60. So that's about what, 42 bucks away from the money on both the call and the put. Fairly equidistant strike prices. Now, <clears throat> Here we end up paying $12.57. How many one-year periods are there in one year? Well, there's one, right? So this comes out to about, you know, if, if we do some math, let me grab my calculator here. $12.57 divided by 477.3. That cost comes out to 2.6% a year. That's what our insurance costs us. So even though the you know 1257 looks like a bigger number than the numbers we were talking about before, percentage-wise, it's a very, very small amount and we're covered for an entire year. If we compare that just simply against buying the put, we'd pay $27.17 for the put versus $12.57 for the collar. So basically we get to own the put for less than half the price of what it would cost just to buy the, the put outright. And of course we can do things like look at different strike prices. If we sold maybe like the 510 calls instead of the 520 calls, um, you know, that cost goes down to 10 bucks. If we sell like the 500 strike calls, um, you know, that's $22 and 59 cents. Now we're looking at owning the put for just about five bucks. We end up leaving a fair amount of money on the table so if we're screamingly bullish on this position, uh, we wouldn't like doing that, but we probably wouldn't like the collar at all if we're screamingly bullish on this. 
Now, there are a number of, of case studies that we can talk about on this where collars have been extremely beneficial. It is uh, rumored, I'm not sure if those rumors have been confirmed, but that Mark Cuban, when he sold broadcast.com to Yahoo at the height of the internet bubble, he collared his position. That's, that's the rumor anyway, but uh, I've heard that rumor spoken a number of times. I haven't actually asked Mark Cuban if that's true, but I, I, I'd, I'd imagine it is. <clears throat> that ended up enabling him to retain like a billion dollars or something. He could, have, he could have lost an immense amount of his wealth if he didn't collar his position. That's because it was a very, he had a very concentrated position. It's not like he was just long the market, long the S&P 500. Collars can work really well, not just on the broad market, but also on concentrated wealth positions. People who um, maybe worked at a company and own a substantial position in a particular company. I had a, a private client one time who owned, who was in uh, broadcasting and owned a fair amount of shares of Apple that he got, uh, I, I guess, through his work. And it, it made up more than 50% of his wealth. He wanted to collar that for good reason. Uh, okay. So look, the bottom line is options can provide protection, but the costs must be managed. You can use options to offset costs of other options, and, and you can get a little bit creative with it. Uh, I mentioned before, like I said, it's a little bit out of the scope of this presentation. I mentioned before that you can use zero cost collars, or you can use collars that, um, that where you even get a credit. Some derivations of the collar are the split time collar. That's much a much more advanced strategy than this. Uh, this traditional collar that we're talking about, it tend to be sort of set it and forget it. If you're above or below the strike price, you just know that you're going to end up selling the stock and you're, and you're good with that. Folks who don't want to sell the stock, um, you know, for example, that one private client that I had, he owned the shares of Apple from a very, very low cost basis. He didn't want to sell it. So he had to sort of manage the position a little bit. He had to, if it looked like he was going to end up selling the stock, he would have to do what's called adjustment. If the if his shares of Apple went up too high above the strike price, he would simply buy the calls back and then sell a higher strike. If it looked like it was going to be too far below the put strike price, he would simply sell those puts and then buy some lower strike puts. A derivation of this is the split time collar where we would buy a long-term six month to a year put, protective put, and then sell shorter term closer to the money calls. That's a little bit more beneficial because short term closer to the money options can have a higher theta. That means we can take in over a one year time, we can take in more premium to further offset the cost of that put. And that said, if we're talking about shorter term options, like one month or two weeks, if the underlying goes up or down, we can sort of adjust that strike price. When we roll, we don't have to roll to the same strike price. If the shares are a little bit higher, we can roll to a higher strike. If the shares are a, bit, a little bit lower, we might choose to roll to a lower strike to take in more premium. So there's a whole lot that we can do with collars. This was, uh, a, a great crash course for folks who are new with it. Uh, I hope that that was helpful. If you, uh, if you follow up on this, I will tell you that as an investment oriented strategy, collars are not really a trading oriented strategy. They're more an investment oriented strategy. You've got another really great tool in your toolbox. This has been Dan Passarelli. Trade smart.